Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to tonight's Odyssey presentation. I am, I am truly, truly gratified at the size of the crowd here tonight. I did not realize that I was quite this popular. <laughs> In fact, if I listen to my wife, I'm not popular at all with anybody. Uh, for those of you who I haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Rich Humphrey, and I am on the Odyssey board. Um, we are delighted tonight to be able to have Matt Brojensky with us tonight, uh, an expert in uh, Russian and Ukraine and other former Soviet state um, uh, relations with the United States. Um, when discussing topics for this year's Odyssey program, we did decide to include um, a speaker in foreign um, affairs and areas of conflict and decided to take a break from the Middle East because even we get tired of that after a while um, and decided on Russia and when when Dennis Kerrigan identified and then spoke to Matt Rojansky um, I don't I think Dennis would even admit he was not quite so prescient as to um, believe that this would be quite the hot topic that it's going to be tonight um, Um, let's see. The fact that uh, we've got Matt to come down to Harbor Ridge and speak to us, I think, was in, almost entirely due uh, to Dennis's presentation of the Harbor Ridge community as a very sophisticated and knowledgeable audience, and the fact that they were going to include a family vacation in southern Florida when there's six inches of snow in D.C. probably had nothing to do with this decision <laughs> whatsoever. Um, I, I'm not going to repeat what you can read in your program about Matt's background um, and qualifications as an expert in U.S. relations with the uh, former Soviet Union, um, including Russia particularly, as well as the Ukraine and, and the other uh, former Soviet uh, states that are now independent but are less in the news um, here. Before I bring Matt up, I'd like to, um, to do our, our typical Odyssey pitch. Like uh, National Public Radio and, and Public Television, we are dependent on your support. Unlike National Public Radio and Public Television, we get no support from the federal government or any state or local government or even from Harbor Ridge. So we are entirely dependent on your generosity. Uh, for those of you who have already supported Odyssey, thank you very much. We really appreciate your generosity. Uh, for those who have not done so yet, if you would like to continue to have these types of programs available to you here at Harbor Ridge, uh, please think about supporting Odyssey as we go forward. Um, tonight we're going to follow our usual procedure and that Matt will do a approximately 30 or 40 minute presentation on, um, on Russia and the Ukraine. It's the background and how we got to where we are today and what some of the implications are for the future. And then after that we'll open up the floor for questions. When we do that, uh, and in particular tonight, because we have such a large crowd, uh, we will have two people uh, who are, will have hand microphones. If you raise your hand and get, and get recognized, please wait for the microphone to come to you before you ask your question so that uh, Matt will not have to repeat everything. Okay, and with that, I would like to welcome Matt Rojansky. Please warm, give him a warm welcome. Um, so why don't we start by giving me that show of hands. Anybody who's been to Russia or the former Soviet Union or the Soviet Union before? Wow. Okay. All right. This is a really well-traveled bunch. I'm impressed. And for those of you who haven't, go. You still can. Um, I'm actually going to talk really first about the foundations of the U.S.-Russia relationship and, in fact, the lack of foundations in the U.S.-Russia relationship. We can move on a little bit, talk about Ukraine, and then I want to get into Q&A. And uh, I've asked Rich to give me hand signals, make sure I stay on track here. I don't want to bore you guys. I want to make sure you get out there and enjoy the beautiful evening. Um, I kind of like to start, though, with the ways in which, by the way, that's the, I don't know if anybody caught this, that was the U.S.-Russia hockey match during, unbelievable match, unbelievable. I think it ended in a triple overtime. They were in the shootout. It was an unbelievable game. And of course, the Russians complained about the officiating because they did have a goal that got overturned. But um, I don't bring this up with my Russian friends, but go Team USA. So uh, I like to start, though, with, with how, despite the way that we're cast as being almost inimical foes 
in the media and popular culture. Um, you know, political cartoons give you endless fodder for this, especially uh, recently. Um, we're really not that different. And we're not, we're not different in important ways, in ways that often uh, escape the attention of kind of the political chattering class. Um, so first of all, we're both unique as Atlantic and Pacific nations. Uh, essentially continental nations, very few of those in the world. And we're also both unique in a sense of destiny. We called it manifest destiny here in America, go west, my son, uh, go south to Florida. Uh, but there's always a place to go. For the Russians, it was the east, the endless expanse of Siberia. And I actually just completed my first Trans-Siberian Railroad trip uh, this past fall, which was in a way following in the footsteps of the man uh, for whom my institution, the Kennan Institute in Washington, is named. It is, in fact, not George F. Kennan, the famous early Cold War ambassador to Moscow, but rather uh, George Kennan the Elder, he was known. He was a late 19th century American explorer of Siberia. And he actually went in 1865, uh, having served as a telegrapher, uh, telegraph operator during the Civil War, uh, to try and complete a telegraph route from Alaska across the Bering Strait through Siberia and thence on to Europe. So it would connect North America and Europe the other way around, the western route. And of course, two years into this journey in the middle of the Siberian wasteland, riding on a dog sled, he ran into someone who gave him the news they'd completed the Atlantic Cable. So he had to come home. But he came home full of stories and wonder and excitement about this place, Russia. Uh, and I share that wonder and excitement uh, even if I don't have the man's uh, ambition and judgment, let's say. Um, but then in terms of values, a very interesting conclusion is often drawn about Russians based on their leadership and the forms of government that they've had. People say, you get the government that you deserve, right? And so people conclude, well, if Vladimir Putin is Darth Vader, then the Russians must be stormtroopers. Well, actually, Russian values are really not that different than our own. Uh, what's different is the word order and the punctuation, right? So it's like each shoots and leaves. Hence the, uh, the picture of the panda. Um, or let's eat, comma, grandma, versus let's eat grandma. Um, <laughs> so I try and make these points memorable, you know, humor. Um, so actually, uh, what are uh, ordinary Russian values? Well, as I say, they're not unlike ours. They're just ordered a little bit differently. So the first value, and this is based on experience, is to live decently. And that means stability, prosperity, certain basic freedoms. And in this respect, Russians are doing quite well. Life in Russia today is better than at any time in Russian history, ever. It is better than in the 1990s, for sure, when Russians suffered after the collapse of the Soviet Union and their entire way of life. It's certainly better than in Soviet times, and it's better than in Tsarist times. Of course, they have a long way to go on development, modernization. A lot of people say, you know, the Russians are about 20 to 30 years behind where we are and where Western Europe is. Um, the second major value is to be Russian, right? We don't often think about this, uh, but actually to be able to live in a Russian way and the belief that Russia is a great world civilization or a center of a great world civilization. Now, this isn't necessarily exclusive of being European uh, or of being Eurasian, but it is distinct to be Russian. And it comes with an idea that has been exceptionally important in US relations with Russia over the past 20 years, and that is that Russia must be respected and appreciated. And oftentimes, Western criticism of Russian politics or of Russian policies bleeds into this territory of dismissiveness towards Russia. Russia kind of doesn't matter. Uh, and then lastly, and again, remember the order is important here, to be free. Freedom, you would argue, is the paramount value in the United States. It's important for Russians, but it comes in a different order. Personal freedoms are most important. The freedom to travel, to speak, to practice one's religion. And in fact, Russians do enjoy these freedoms today almost without any constraint. But in political freedoms, they have a different experience than we do. That's resulted in a different priority on political freedom. Certainly there are some Russians who pour out into the streets, who protest, who organize their own political parties. But by and large, political freedoms come lower down on the totem pole. Now what's the worldview of Russia's elite? It's a little bit different. If you think about the elite of Russia today, the people who are in their 50s, 60s, very peak of their careers, what experiences shaped their worldview? the collapse of the Soviet empire, the chaos of the 1990s. And so it's the loss of all things that at the height, at the, at the, at the, uh, the upswing in their professional development was collapsing around them. There's a sense that the world is an inherently dangerous and unpredictable place. There's also a sense that the United States and the West generally was indifferent to this when it happened, that we did a victory lap 
while Russia was in flames. Of course, we know the Russian economy is heavily dependent on energy and commodity exports, but what that means is, and those of you in business will understand, they're heavily dependent on an inherently uncertain market. The only thing you can say about energy prices that's always accurate is that they will fluctuate. And that reduces very much the economic viability of the Russian state to the fluctuation of the world energy market. Again, leads to uncertainty. And then lastly, the increasing centrality of the Russian state, the idea that it has been the resurgence of the Russian state that has driven Russia's recovery since the post-Soviet collapse, means that that state is inherently less resilient. Because, of course, we know, again, from portfolio theory, that the more drivers you have of growth and prosperity, the more stable that prosperity is. But if it's just the state and you don't have a strong civil society, you don't have a strong private sector, then obviously you have a less resilient situation. So that's the world in which the Russian elite operate. And what do they want? Well, they want to be treated as equals by the West. They want to sit at the top table. But they recognize that they're going to have to work with others. Usually, the United States and Europe are the partners of first choice, but not if it requires a sacrifice of what Russians view as their independent interests. So if, as President uh, George W. Bush said uh, in his second term, gosh, the Russians just don't understand what their interests are, if we come to the Russians and tell them what their interests are, they're not going to have a conversation with us. They want to say what their interests are. They want to come to the table with their own positions. The Russians recognize that they're not going to get a better deal out of the Chinese. They're going to be a junior partner to Beijing, not the other way around the way it used to be. And so they often think of themselves as playing this flexible role as middleman. Uh, think about the role that they've played on the Iran nuclear situation, uh, on Syria brokering the chemical weapons deal, even on Libya where they attempted but failed to stop Western military intervention. They also tend to believe that they, Russians, are rational, while others are more influenced by politics and hypocrisy. And they cite some interesting examples. Uh, think about American obsession with human rights on Russia, and yet the very little commentary that the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia, in China, even Mexico receives. Uh, think about the American concern and the Western concern about Iran's nuclear program. A middle-sized Muslim country in an unstable region getting a nuclear weapon. But I guess then there was 1997 when Pakistan got a nuclear weapon. The Russians point to that as, well, you just kind of shrugged your shoulders and said, it's OK. We can live with it. Why, for example, are Poland, the Baltic states, even potentially Ukraine, OK to join things like the European Union and NATO, but not Russia? Again, it's not that Russians necessarily want these things. But in these positions from the United States, they tend to find hypocrisy. And that hypocrisy irks them. Now, why do we have to care about Russia in the first place? Sure. Russia's nuclear arsenal, right? It is the only existential threat to the United States. It is the only weapon on Earth which is capable of eliminating this country in less than 30 minutes. It also happens to be the second largest supplier of conventional weapons on Earth after us. The Russians have a swing vote on the UN Security Council. Nothing gets done in international law and international governance without a Russian agreement. The Russians are vital to resolving regional conflicts all around the world. I understand you guys have had lectures on the Middle East before. Don't forget the Russians are part of the quartet on the Middle East peace process. They're also part of the six-party talks on North Korea. They're obviously part of the Iran situation, Syria, and on and on. They have unique capabilities to deal with 21st century challenges, disaster relief, cyber crime, trafficking, these kinds of problems with global reach, piracy. And the reason for that is not only the Soviet legacy that they inherited a superpower's capabilities, it's also the desire. They view themselves in this way. You know, think about France, right? A country that tends to punch a little bit above its weight class because, like de Gaulle, it sees itself in that way. The, Ru the Russians do as well. And of course, Russia is gigantic. Spans 11 time zones. Borders on regions like Central Asia and East Asia. Great importance to the United States. Its environment is vital to the world. Lake Baikal contains 20% of the world's unfrozen fresh water alone, just one lake in Russia. In terms of energy, I hardly have to tell you, Russia is an energy superpower. Germany consumes about 40% of its gas from Russia. Other countries in Europe, 80 to 100%. Of course, the Russians can sell to China. They can sell to Japan. Energy is fungible. And of course, Russia is a large market in its own right. Uh, it's the 10th, 11th, or 12th, depending on when you check, largest market in the world. It has the second or third largest foreign currency reserves. And Russians tend to like to buy American products. That's the good news. 
the Ford Focus was for three years in a row the best-selling foreign car in Russia. Boeing has sold $50 billion worth of aircraft. Pepsi acquired for $6 billion in 2010, Russia's largest drink maker. And of course, ExxonMobil's deal with Rosneft to exploit Arctic oil is becoming well known. Now, how have we dealt with Russia in the past, given the importance of this country? Well, in the 1990s, we had this idea that, you know, Russia's on its knees after the post-Soviet collapse. Let's rebuild them, but let's build them in our own image. At the same time, of course, from the Russian perspective, we were slicing off pieces of their heritage and their former empire. NATO expanded, uh, to use a phrase in the 1990s, to Russia's doorstep. In 1989, George H.W. Bush supposedly promised to Gorbachev that NATO would not go beyond East Germany. Uh, but in fact, we found in 1999, with the inclusion of Poland into NATO, and then in 2003, with the inclusion of the Baltic states, that a piece of Russian territory called Kaliningrad, which is actually an exclave within Europe, was entirely isolated and surrounded by NATO countries, not a comfortable position to be in. Uh, ballistic missile defense deployed in Poland and Romania may make sense against an Iranian threat, or maybe not, depending on what you think of the physics, but it certainly doesn't make sense <clears throat> when you think about the fact that Romania and Poland have extremely tense, distrustful relationships with Russia, and in their countries, ballistic missile defense was seen as a tripwire. Putting a couple of Americans on the ground was the way that America was going to choose their side in a confrontation with Russia against the Russians. This is just a, a stamp uh, from World War II illustrating that Romania was, in fact, a Nazi ally during the war and is still thought of in that way in Russia. And in Romania, Russia is still thought of as a Bolshevik communist occupier. Those two countries have no trust and have never reconciled with each other. So in fact, when we bring on <clears throat> new NATO allies expanding the zone of security and prosperity and stability in Europe, oftentimes we're bringing problems into our backyard uh, Latvia, for example, where the SS veterans uh, parade on, on every Latvian Independence Day, again, not terribly well uh, viewed in, in Russia. So in the 2000s, we tried a different approach. Uh, George W. Bush had the idea of selective cooperation. Cooperate with Russia like with any normal country. In other words, work together when it makes sense, ignore each other when you couldn't agree on things. Problem was, you can't treat Russia like any normal country. If you don't give Russia sustained and high-level attention, they don't feel that they have that seat at the table. They don't feel that they're being treated commensurate with their status, and the relationship breaks down. So you really do need a special relationship between the United States and Russia. What else did we do in the 2000s? And here is where the problem lay. We promoted democracy, right? We supported things like Ukraine's first revolution, the Orange Revolution in 2004. And we argued to the Russians that you're next on the list. John McCain made himself famous for saying that. Putin is next. Obviously not terribly well received by the Kremlin. And the results were obvious. We encouraged Misha Saakashvili, the, re the so-called reformist president of Georgia, although I refer to him more as a Bolshevik Democrat, right? He preached the ideology of democracy and he locked people up in prison and tortured them for not being democratic enough. Uh, he invaded the separatist territories of Georgia, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia that were backed by Russia and started a war. Why did he do it? Because we told him he was going to join NATO. We said, you will be a member of NATO. And he said, great, well, you'll back me up. Well, we weren't there to back him up, and he went to war with Russia anyway. And of course, we have a seriously anemic economic relationship as a result, and very little trust with the Russians, and we're reaping the benefits of that today when we deal with the Ukraine situation. So what did we do over the last six years uh, since Obama was elected and the reset was announced? Well, the idea of reset was kind of an air clearing, right? It wasn't that we were going to fix everything, the relationship was going to become perfect, but kind of get out of this phase of love and hate, right? You know, George W. Bush and Putin looked into each other's eyes and they saw each other's souls. They either loved each other or they despised each other. Obama, very different. Cold, process-oriented, a lawyer, Medvedev, who at that time, President of Russia, very similar, cold, process-oriented, modern. They both had iPads. Unfortunately, the relationship was still personality-driven. Everything depended on the compatibility of the personality of these two leaders. And there was another leader in the picture, Mr. Putin, who has a very different personality. He saw reset in very different terms. If for Obama and Medvedev, reset was about moving to old business that should have gotten done earlier, moving it through the, through the system and getting it done. For Putin, it was about going back to history and apologizing for everything the United States had done wrong. 
So when he had his first meeting with President Obama as president, this is at his dacha in Moscow in 2009, what was supposed to be an hour-long meeting to just kind of formally cap off the agenda that the two presidents, Obama and Medvedev, had already agreed upon, Putin turned into a 90-minute lecture about everything the United States had done wrong from the Cold War up to that moment. And Obama did not realize that what was being done to him was that the reset was already being undermined. Now, there were plenty of accomplishments. I don't want to undersell that. Um, in 2009 and 2010, we created a bilateral presidential working group that had working groups on everything from Arctic and energy cooperation to nuclear weapons to innovation, rule of law, and even civil society. But again, this was old business. Clinton created something like that in the 1990s. We signed a new nuclear agreement, the New START Treaty, also old business. Remember the original START Treaty? Remember the SORT Treaty? We had these treaties. They'd expired already. Old business, low-hanging fruit. We signed a new civilian nuclear cooperation agreement in 2010. How long had civilian nuclear power been around and how long had both countries had it? Half a century? We established new military-military cooperation, for example, in Afghanistan, to supply the northern distribution route for NATO troops in Afghanistan, to deal with counter-narcotics challenges. How old is the Afghan problem? Well, we've been there at least 10 years, and you could argue it's a 150-year-old problem. In May of 2011, we had the first ever joint NATO-Russian naval exercise. It was called Bold Monarch for some reason. Um, I understand it took place off the coast of Spain in May. Probably a nice place to hang out if you're Russian and American sailors. But here's the sad part. In 2005, a Russian submarine called the Kursk had an accident and ended up at the bottom of the ocean. There were NATO assets in the area. They could have saved those 200 sailors but they failed. So again, this was long delayed and obviously needed business. And then in 2012, we finally got Russia into the WTO. We had been negotiating to do that for 17 years. So the argument here isn't that the reset didn't get anything done. It got a lot of things done. But it was a lot of stuff that was backlogged and that was obvious, low-hanging fruit. The problem comes when you try to build something new. And that's because our foundations for this relationship are extremely weak. This is a picture of a Russian visa that can be very difficult to get. Why? Because the Russians take our visa process and mirror it. Again, this idea that they are our equal and they need to be treated as our equal. We used to require a blood and urine sample for people coming from the former Soviet Union to prove they did not have HIV or a T TB or any of these terrible diseases. They did the exact same thing. How many of you guys want to give a blood and urine sample before you go on a tour? Not a lot, I imagine, right? In 2011, this is after the reset, 211,000 uh, Russian tourists visited the United States. Sounds like a reasonable number, especially when you compare it to 2002, when only 62,000 visited. But compare it to Germany, which has a considerably smaller population than Russia, which sent 2 million visitors in 2011, when Germany was in the middle of a financial crisis, or Brazil, which has a considerably smaller economy than Russia, which sent one and a half million people to the United States. So the scale of our tourist relationship with Russia is extremely small. Russia is not even in the top 25 destinations for US exchange students. Less than 1% go to Russia. Now, I'm not arguing every exchange student or every other should go to Russia. But think about the place of Russia in American education, the place of Russian science, music, literature in the Western canon. 1%? The three-year multi-entry visa agreement that we signed two years ago is a good step, but the Russians asked for visa-free travel, and our answer was fat chance, right? So how do we expect to have a foundation with these people when we don't even see each other and we don't even know each other? Trade is still relatively anemic. I'm sorry to say the latest numbers are actually worse. Uh, for a while, we had been going up. We, we reached a height in 2012 of $44 billion in total bilateral trade. Uh, now we're back down to $38 billion with decreases last year and this year, and we're on track to be even lower than that this year. We have sanctions in place, so it's going to be much lower. Um, the total result, though, even at its height, at $44 billion, was less than 2% of Russia's total bilateral trade with other countries, and less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of total U.S. trade. So obviously, if you don't have an economic stake in the relationship, how do you expect to have a political stake? Think about how decisions get made in Washington when you have people who have skin in the game lobbying to get things done. You just don't have a lot of that when it comes to Russia. And of course, 
it's hard to have real partnership with a country when our respective nuclear arsenals are pointed at one another. Now, what's going on right now in the U.S.-Russia relationship? It's not all about Ukraine, and it hasn't always been about Ukraine. From about late 2011, the relationship began to break down. And it broke down over something that started, being called, started as being called the white movement. This was a protest movement. They liked to choose colors for their movements in, in former Soviet Union, uh, which was based on the idea that Putin was going to return to the presidency basically without consulting anyone in the country. But he just had Medvedev, his puppet, puppet announced that Putin would be the nominee and that, sure enough, he'd be president. And then, of course, right after Putin announced this and right after people turned out in the streets to protest, we sent a new ambassador to Moscow, a guy called Mike McFall, who wrote a book about Russia's unfinished revolution. So again, you know, think about these themes I'm talking about. We're promoting revolutions in the former Soviet space. Putin is paranoid. He's returning. He wants to return to the presidency. Russians are protesting. And we send an ambassador who has authored a book about revolution in Russia, unfinished revolution in Russia. Um, obviously, this was not well received. So McFall started to be hounded by Russian state-run television crews. This is him chewing one of them out. Um, really had a breakdown in the relationship. And by the way, this is a very striking contrast because the guy that Mike McFall, by the way, Mike was one of my professors at Stanford, so you know, nothing against the guy personally. But the guy he replaced, a guy called John Byerly, was a fantastically effective ambassador who he actually replaced early. I mean, John was removed early in his term. And he had the unbelievable uh, connection with Russians. You could not buy for money if you wanted to. And that is that his father served in both the U.S. Army and the Red Army during World War II. How is it possible? He was a prisoner of war. He was liberated by the Red Army. He rode a Soviet tank into Berlin, right? Unbelievable experience. If you know anything about Russia, you know that this is instant primo bonding territory. I mean, you, you could not pay for a better uh, bio story than John Byerly's father had, and we pulled him out of Russia early. Um, then, of course, we got Russia into the WTO, as I said, after 17 years. But we added insult to the injury of that delay by passing something called the Justice for Sergei Magnitsky Act. Now, Sergei Magnitsky, terrible case. Guy died in custody uh, over corruption allegations. Totally abused. No question. It was a human rights violation. This act imposed sanctions on a list of named Russian officials over this one case. Now, the Russians' objection to this was, first of all, why are you singling us out? Where is your China Sanctions Act? Where's your Saudi Sanctions Act? Where's your Mexico Sanctions Act? That it was superfluous to pass this legislation because the State Department could do this anyway. And actually, just last week, the Obama administration proved that. Without any action by Congress, they can impose sanctions on Russian individuals. So again, why did you need a piece of legislation? And then, worst of all, that it was vague. What constitutes a human rights violation? OK, the Magnitsky case, sure. They were investigating that case. But there were other human rights violations vaguely named in this legislation. The problem is it's eye of the beholder. For the Russians, their security officials are protecting Russian lives. But we criticize from the outside and we say, well, you're too abusive in Chechnya. You're not respectful enough of your Muslim minority, et cetera, et cetera. And we actually paid the cost for this not long after the Magnitsky Act was adopted when a couple of Chechen-linked Americans blew up a bomb, you might remember this, at the Boston Marathon. Now, who are the guys who should have been sharing intelligence with us on that? They are the guys that we named in the Magnitsky Act and imposed sanctions on, security officials in Russia's North Caucasus. And of course, the Russians warned us that after this, there'd be an asymmetrical reaction. Um, they banned adoption of Russian orphans by Americans on absurd, trumped up grounds, citing just nine cases out of 40,000 adoptions in which um, young children had died under mysterious circumstances. Um, the Russians announced in March of 2012 that US financed Russian NGOs dealing with politics would have to leave the country. Uh, it's sort of the idea of bringing the house down around their ears in order to bring it down on us. They have relatively limited leverage. Think about the economic relationship. They're not going to start a nuclear war. So what can they do? They can hurt themselves to show us that they're relevant. And this is exactly what they did. And they created a new atmosphere of fear and uncertainty in the relationship. And of course, things kept getting worse. I mentioned the Tsarnaev bombers in April of last year. But things got worse after that. There was this guy, Ryan Fogel, an American spy who was outed in Moscow in May. And then the Russians revealed the name of the US uh, CIA station chief in Moscow, which I guess in the world of spies is like a big no-no. I don't know. I like having my name in the press. It's good for my career. I guess not if you're a CIA. Uh, and then in June, there was this guy, Snowden shows up unexpectedly in the airport in Moscow, and the Russians love sticking their finger in, 
in our eye over that one. Although, by the way, I don't think the Russians were expecting this, and I think the Chinese got all the benefit of Snowden's information, and the Russians paid all the costs. But that's typically the way it works, like at the UN Security Council. The Russians vote no, the Russians use their veto, and the Chinese just sort of quietly support them. Um, he's probably more of a liability and a loose cannon for the Russians, ultimately, than he's worth. Uh, then in June, they passed the anti-gay laws. Then in July, they convicted a guy called Alexei Navalny on the eve of his running for mayor of Moscow. And he was a bit of a cause celeb for, uh, for American experts on Russia. In August, Obama canceled a summit with Putin that he himself had asked for. Again, what could be more insulting? Uh, in October, the US government canceled uh, the only program, the main program, which I'm an alumnus of, that supports research on the former Soviet Union. It's a three and a half million dollar program. So that, that kind of money you know, falls off the back of the truck in Washington daily. Uh, but that had to be canceled for budgetary reasons, so now we don't have any federally funded research on Russia. Uh, and then in November, of course, the protests in Ukraine began, and we know how that has ended up so far. Oh, and let's not forget about the phone call. Victoria Nuland, you know, uh, <clears throat> fork the EU, I believe she said. But it really wasn't about the EU. She apologized to the Europeans. They didn't care. They don't even know what that word means. This was about Russia. It was about Russia because what was the United States doing revealed in that phone call, which of course was, was recorded by Russian secret services and, and broadcast. The United States was orchestrating Ukrainian domestic politics to get an anti-Russian coalition into power. That was the important message of this recorded phone call. Now there's been a little bit more damage control recently. Uh, late last year we had the announcement of a Syria chemical weapons deal. We'll see if it actually goes through. Uh, in December last year, Putin released the major political prisoners in advance of Sochi, right? He didn't want to have that on his conscience and on his record before Sochi, including this guy, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, used to be the richest man in Russia, uh, tried to challenge Putin politically, so he threw him in jail for 10 years. But also the other ones, Pussy Riot, the Greenpeace activists, even some of those white movement protesters, he let them all go, a grand gesture of sort of uh, extreme power and confidence. And then in February of this year, Mike McFall left. The unfinished revolution is now finished. Mike's gone. Um, so that may be the end, for now, of gratuitous personal attacks on American diplomats. Maybe we can re return to professionalism. And then, as we know, the Sochi Olympics went pretty well, uh, despite that questionable call on the Russian goal in the hockey match. It was not a big Russia versus America showdown. It was actually a pretty successful sporting event. All right, so let's talk a little bit about R Ukraine and Crimea now. What does Russia want? Well, this is about a couple of things. First and foremost is domestic politics. This is Putin making the point that the only legitimate way to maintain power is through a managed election. Now, bear in mind, that's Yanukovych, the recently ousted president of Ukraine. These guys hate each other. Yanukovych, Yanukovych, well, Putin is the cop, right? Former KGB, man of law and order, invented the so-called power vertical in Russia. Yanukovych is the robber. Yanukovych twice convicted in Soviet times for assault and battery, totally linked up with the mafia in eastern Ukraine. These guys can't stand each other. But for Putin, it's the precedent that matters. Yanukovych came to power through a manipulated election. If people can pour out into the streets in a brotherly Slavic nation that is so close to Russia that most Russians have a grandparent living in Ukraine, why can't they do it in Russia? That's unacceptable. He has to send the message that if anybody tries that, he will respond with force. His credibility is also on the line. He's argued that the Euromaidan protest movement in Ukraine was a fascist coup. Well, he's got to provoke these people to show that they are fascists. And as soon as the Ukrainians use violence, they will prove that. The more chaos there is in Ukraine, the better Putin looks. He must be firm and strong and ultimately correct. And that's what his intervention in Ukraine has been about, domestic politics. It's also about geopolitics. He's proposed to create this thing called the Eurasian Union. Well, what is the Eurasian Union? You could sort of call it the new USSR, although without the SS part, right? No socialism and no Soviet. It's not ideological. But it is about restoring Russia's sphere of influence and restoring Putin's credibility as a man who designs a vision and delivers on that vision. Now, without Ukraine, it's not much of an empire. So he's got to be able to, at the very least, if not bring U Ukraine into the Union, block them from leaving it by joining up with the EU and NATO. And then, of course, it is about NATO. I mentioned that before. Ukraine is a red line. Never will Russia accept that NATO troops will be the ones welcoming them when they pull into their Black Sea fleet base in Sevastopol. Never. 
Not back to the 19th century did they accept Western intervention in Ukraine, nor will they accept it today. So what should US policy be? Well, short term, it certainly is prevent accidents from happening. I think the biggest danger in Ukraine is not that Putin has a grand design, an invasion plan, how is he going to get his tanks to Kiev. If he even tried that, first the Ukrainians would fight him and then we would end up fighting him. I think the big problem here is accidental escalation, that no one's really in control of these wild nationalists, and indeed some of them are fascists, who have been unleashed on both sides. So the possibility that something that's beyond Putin's control, beyond Kiev's control, and beyond the West's control might be unleashed, I think is very real. So we need observers on the ground, and we need a process of diplomacy so that we at least have a credible way of intervening if an escalation begins. In the middle term, I think we need credible and serious threats and responses in terms of sanctions. Targeted sanctions are not going to work. This is Putin with uh, his buddy Igor Sechin. Putin's oligarchs are not like Yanukovych's oligarchs in Ukraine. They will not abandon him at the first sign of trouble. These are people who are tightly disciplined. Many of them are former KGB. Oil is thicker than blood, is thicker than water, right? These people will stand by each other because they either all stand or they all fall. And they know that. Putin has been arguing for two years or more with these people to remove their assets that are held abroad. Right? Their real estate in Florida has gotten a lot of members of the Russian parliament in trouble. And it's not just a sham crusade against uh, corruption. It's so that the Russian elite will be immune from exactly these kind of targeted sanctions we're trying to impose on him now. And targeted sanctions also play into the narrative that, the, that, the, that Putin has argued that all we're interested in the West is individuals. We're just interested in regime change. We just want to change the leaders of countries here, there, and everywhere willy-nilly, just like we did in Iraq, just like we did in Afghanistan. That's his narrative. No, if we want sanctions to matter, we have to be prepared to impose real costs on the Russian economy. That is going to hurt ordinary people, and it's going to hurt us. But we have to be prepared to pay those costs. And right now, Putin doesn't believe that we have the same pain threshold that the Russians do. And he's right. And in the long term, the long term game here, the long term victory is Ukraine's success. You know, there's a term that became very popular in Russia, over, uh, in, in Washington, excuse me, over the past few years, called Ukraine fatigue. And that's because after the Orange Revolution in 2004, we quickly lost interest in Ukraine because it didn't live up to our expectations. Well, if we don't want that to happen again, we have to be prepared to invest in this place because this is the default in Ukraine. Fist fights in the Verkhovna Rada, which is Ukraine's parliament. It's a post-Soviet country. It's deeply corrupt. It's deeply flawed institutionally. In order to change that, the one thing Yanukovych was actually right about was when he asked for a $200 billion bailout from the Europeans before signing the association agreement. Ukraine's going to take that level of investment from the West, financially, politically, socially, in every sense, to be a success story. But Ukraine's success as a liberal democracy, as a modern European country, is Putin's defeat. That is the long-term game. More broadly, what, what do we do to deal with Russia? Well, look, Russia's not going away, OK? And they can't be bludgeoned into submission. We've got to take Russian interests into account. We've got to recognize they ultimately de decide what their interests are, not us. And that's going to be the case no matter what kind of government Russia has, with or without Mr. Putin. The Russians are going to need to have a stake in developing the agenda. And we have to remember that treating Russia as an equal partner makes them feel big. So we have to at least take them seriously. And here I'll tell you a story that a very senior American military officer told me. He said that um, one July 4th, after the reset, the Russians flew a long-range strategic aviation mission very close to California, scarily close to California. And the US uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Russian chief of general staff were supposed to have a meeting a couple days after this. And so the chairman, in an off-record moment, privately decided to bring up to, the, to his Russian counterpart, you know, why did you guys do this? If you'd wanted an invitation to our Fourth of July party, we'd have set a table for or set a place for you at the table. Should have just asked. The Russian said, well, why did you fly dangerously close to Russia on June 12th? And Mullen, at the time, said, June 12th, what are you talking about? He said, that's our national day. We didn't even think about that. In fact, he went back, he checked the records. We had flown the exact same mission exactly as close to the Russian borders. They simply paid us back in kind. It's just like the visa applications, just like everything else. They want equal treatment. Our ability to secure cooperation from the Russians depends on the institutional foundations of the relationship. 
If we don't have trade ties, if we don't have travel ties, which means visas, if we don't have an official track with working groups and contacts on every issue, we're not going to have any kind of relationship and we're not going to have any leverage. How do we deal with Russia on the hard things like human rights where we know we're going to disagree? Don't just agree to disagree and walk away. We know that that doesn't work. Find a common language. For example, under international law, it is our right and obligation, just as Russia's right and obligation, to protect and advocate the interests of U.S. citizens living abroad. Well, the difference of Russia today versus Russia 30 years ago is that there are now 10,000 Americans living and doing business in Moscow. Well, if we advocate their rights, their property ownership, rule of law for their benefit, their access to the courts, we're not telling Russians in the abstract how to live. Oh, you should have democracy because it's good for you. No, we're saying this is what's good for Americans. They actually understand that and they respect that, but we never approach it in this way. We have reciprocal commitments under any number of international treaties, the Helsinki Final Act, UN Declaration on Human Rights, the Vienna Convention, European Convention on Human Rights. If we want to hold, if, we, if they want us to hold up our end of the bargain, they got to hold up theirs. Reciprocity. They love reciprocity. And then finally, a little honesty, a little explanation of how our system actually works. I call it help me help you, like Jerry Maguire, right? The idea is, sorry, this is weak foundations, right? What happens with, although I guess down here sometimes that's just sinkholes, unavoidable. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we got to be a little more transparent about when Congress does something, like it passes the Magnitsky Sanctions Act. What the heck was going on there? Why did that happen? How does American politics work? Because otherwise the Russians will conclude this is our formal policy towards Russia. The same White House that announces a reset is now slapping sanctions on a dozen Russian officials. It doesn't make sense to them. Finally, what can you do about it? Sorry, trust but verify bilateral agreements. Go see Russia yourself. Don't take my word for it. And, and by the way, for those of you who have already been, don't just go to the classic tourist sites, Moscow and St. Petersburg. Go to Siberia. I know it sounds intimidating. Siberia is actually amazing. It's beautiful. Try some of the, uh, the so-called uh, golden circle sites outside of Moscow. Russia's a giant country with very diverse people, very interesting places to see. So I think with that, I'll wrap it up and take your questions. OK. I suspect there probably might be a few questions once again. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand, wait till the microphone comes to you, and then stand up and ask your question so that uh, Matt won't have to repeat it, please. So this, this is a country, I'd like to talk about demographics a little bit if we can. This is a country that is smaller than Pakistan as far as number of people. Now granted it has nuclear weapons and everything, but can you speak in a long-term basis as to the demographics of uh, Russia? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. So. Uh, Population. Uh, Russia is about 145 million or so today. Um, supposedly, last year was the first year that Russia's population grew since 1991. Um, so it is possible, if you believe the official statistics on this, and they, they don't have a lot of reason to lie on those, that the corner has been turned. Uh, the brain drain, which resulted in, in just people emigrating from the country altogether, um, and then the declining birth rate because of poverty have been turned around. Uh, probably no thanks to government policies, although there actually is a policy in place that encourages motherhood, so payments for motherhood, basically you get, you get cash payments for having kids. Um, tried things like that in this country, obviously can go in some untoward directions and they'll have more of those orphans uh, to deal with. But um, obviously overall Russia is not in a strong position demographically, uh, although they did just acquire two million more citizens with Crimea for what that's worth. Um, I do think the corner's probably been turned. One of the, one of the um, demographic factors is the shape of their, of their age brackets. So they have the same kind of post-World War II baby boom, which now has an echo boom, which is about to endure an echo echo boom. So most likely you will see a turnaround in the population in the next decade uh, with a lot more kids being born. But that said, everything depends on the Russian economy. And growth has been revised to less than 1% for 2014. Um, possibly a little over 1% for 2015 if they stick with the trajectory. I mean, that's astonishingly low. But the thing about Russia is that almost 5% of the economy on an annual basis leaves the country in capital flight. 
right? That's because people have very low confidence in the country's economy, so they squirrel the money away internationally. That's why we think that these sanctions, targeted sanctions, will work, uh, because it'll target people's assets. I still think it won't, but that's a separate story. What that means is take that same 5% number. If you can change the conditions for investment in Russia and make investment in Russia more appealing, you've automatically got a huge amount of the economy that can be quickly repatriated and reinvested in the country. So you could turn a 0.5 or a 1% growth rate into a 2 or 3 or 4% growth rate without a lot of, you know, sort of going out and winning new friends and allies for the Russian economy. So I think if the economy does well, again, people are going to have kids, the demographics will turn around, and the one thing they have plenty of is space. I hope that answers your question. Uh, regarding the uh, Ukraine, uh, we heard that uh, all the pipelines and the access to the uh, Crimea uh, would have to come through the eastern Ukraine and that 25% uh, of the people there are Russians. Uh, do you think uh, Putin is going to want to take over that part? Well, he, he said he has no interest in it. Now, right, I mean, what he said, no, that said, j just to be clear, um, I think he's a man of his word in a certain way, which is to say, um, looking dishonest in a very obvious and public way, or, which is worse for him, looking like you're not in control, is a dangerous for, thing for him domestically. So he can scare his own military industrial establishment if he doesn't really appear to have a serious strategy for victory, and testing the mettle of the Russian army against the Ukrainians and whoever else might at that point get involved and getting into a protracted guerrilla war is probably not smart for him. It probably will make him look weak. He doesn't need an Afghanistan war to have to solve. I think the second reason is he's gotten most of what he wants in Ukraine. So he got Crimea basically without violence or bloodshed by just seizing it very, very quickly and moving a lot faster than anyone else was prepared to, including in the West. And he's got the leverage that he now needs in order to weigh on Kiev. So if the, if the Ukrainians ever want anything in Crimea back, they're probably not getting the land back, but they've got assets there. They have interests there, right? Speaking of pipelines, I thought what you were going to ask about is the pipelines that go from mainland Ukraine through Crimea and to the ports, right? If they want any of those things, they're going to have to negotiate with the Russians. And so one of the things he can now do is make concessions on Crimea in exchange for guarantees from the Ukrainians that they're not going to join the EU, that they're not going to join NATO, or getting some of his allies into power in Kiev, which is ultimately, I think, what he wants. You know, uh, you guys have heard about Yulia Tymoshenko, right? Princess Leia with the hamburger buns on her head. So, so she was, of course, in the process of kicking Yanukovych out of the country, you know, the dictator's gone, blah, 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 released from prison, the great heroine. So the thing about her is, you know, uh, she's horrendously corrupt, like beyond corrupt. They call her the gas princess because in the 1990s she stole like hundreds of millions. And by the way, we in the United States have evidence of this. We put her former cohort, Pablo Lazarenko, who was prime minister when she was energy minister, into prison in California for money laundering, and we have federal court evidence that implicates her in all of those same crimes. So we know this about her. Problem with Yulia is, you know, there's pretty much not a Western leader on the face of the earth who hasn't been photographed hugging her. So it's sort of hard to walk ourselves back off of that ledge. And she's also Putin's best buddy. He backed her in the 2010 elections. So what I suspect is about to happen in the next couple of years in Ukraine is a return to power of Yulia Tymoshenko, either directly or indirectly, and Putin thereby will get everything he wants in Ukraine. But there's not a lot we can say or do about it, given that she's our friend, too. I guess uh, one of the questions I have, one of the questions I have uh, going with the theme of Crimea is, uh, specifically with Russia invading uh, that nation, one of the things I've been reading is that it's specifically for uh, access to a Black Sea port, but again, Sochi and other cities along there also are along the Black Sea. And on top of that, if they wanted to get the Atlantic, they have to go through Istanbul, Gibraltar, and I mean, a lot of other countries would have interest in making sure Russia does not get to the Atlantic. What's, the, what's their end goal for occupying Crimea? Is it purely political, or are there resources there that they see as more valuable to that risk? Well, again, uh, first of all, you got to ask who's the they. Let me speak to the extent that I understand Putin's motivation here. Uh, one, I think it's what I already said, uh, is that he uh, is able to influence Ukraine by having this lever in Crimea. Uh, second, I think, is domestic politics. He shows that he's tough, decisive, that his vision of a greater Russia, Eurasian Union, et cetera, is, is for real. Um, but I think the third thing is... And this is a narrative that actually would apply not just to Putin, but to a great many Russians. And if you watch Russian television, listen, I listen to Russian, the, the Internet's an amazing thing. I now listen to Russian radio 
live in real time when I jog. I just, just listen to Russian talk radio, Russian news. It's fantastic. And you get a completely different perspective on the world and the universe. Um, and the vast majority of Russians will agree that Crimea was always Russian, that it is Russian territory, and that what Mr. Putin is doing is righting a historic wrong, that an injustice was done by Khrushchev by giving it to Ukraine, that an injustice was done by Yeltsin in 1992 by not fighting to get it back, and that Putin, like so many other things that he has turned around in Russia and brought the Russians up from their knees and made them be able to look at you in the face and be a strong and dignified country, he's righting another wrong by bringing Crimea back into the fold. And it sort of is hard to argue with that when you see the photos and the video of jubilant Crimeans, you know, waving the Russian flag, celebrating in the streets. And, you know, if you look at the outcome of this referendum they have, sure, you know, there were armed men at the polling stations. And a lot of people vetoed, you know, or boycotted the referendum. But they did still overwhelmingly vote to join Russia. You can't, you know, it's, it's sort of hard to make a fraudulent 90, you know, a, a fraudulent 40% outcome into a 95% outcome, right? You can cheat 5, 10%. You can't cheat 50%. So I think it is true that this was basically a foreign policy and a domestic policy success. I'd like to move on to something else, uh, something that I, I simply you know talk nothing. China or? Anything? No, no, but Moldova. Moldova <laughs> oh, and the Transnistria. Thank you. Can you explain to us how Moldova, which is way to the west of Odessa, um, has something to do with uh, Moscow in, in, in terms of the Transnistria or whatever. Boy, can I, can I ever? You must have done your research on me. Um, no, I, I love Moldova. I spent a fair amount of time there. Um, anyway, look, Moldova is a Romanian-speaking chunk of territory. It used to be called Bessarabia. Maybe some of you have heard that term. Bessarabia used to actually have a chunk of Black Sea coast. But for long and complex reasons I won't get into, the Soviets sliced off the coastal part and gave that to Ukraine. They did a lot of this kind of stuff. It didn't matter in Soviet times. It was all part of the Soviet Union. So Moldova is a post-Soviet republic versus uh, Romania proper, which is just a post-communist, a former Warsaw Pact country. Um, Transnistria, as the name indicates, trans on the other side of Dniester, the Dniester River, uh, is this little 400 kilometer long, very, very narrow, like 20, 30 kilometer wide strip of territory on the east side. So on the Ukrainian side of the Dniester River. Moldova is on the west side of the Dniester River between the Dniester and the Prut, which separates Moldova from Romania. I actually teach a class on this, so I could really go on. Bottom line is, in 1992, the people living on the east side of the Dniester River in Transnistria, uh, whose capital is Tiraspol, uh, had two things that really differentiated them from the rest of Moldova. One was, Tiraspol was the headquarters of the Soviet 14th Guards Army. And they had actually evacuated a lot of other people and materiel, so like guns, bombs, you know, whatever, cannons, from the Warsaw Pact countries that had been Soviet stuff. Between 89 and 91, they evacuated that to Transnistria. So it was heavily armed, bristling with weapons, and full of the most sort of elite, uh, highly trained, highly, uh, highly ideologized, Soviet military personnel and their families. So think of Transnistria as kind of, you know, uh, the front lines uh, of the Soviet presence in southeastern Europe. And so when Moldova became independent, and this goes back to the whole kind of uh, rival views of history thing, Moldova, one of the things Moldova did was it restored the Romanian language in place of the Russian language. It's the only national language. It said you can speak Russian, but it's not an official language. No documents will be in Russian, et cetera. Starting to sound a little familiar from the Ukraine case, right? Because this is one of the things that the new government in Ukraine did after the revolution last month. And this, of course, freaked out the Russians. You had these super patriotic Soviet guys, and they had all the tanks and guns. So they said, well, forget it. We don't accept your independence from the Soviet Union. And since the Soviet Union is disappearing, we don't accept the disappearance of the Soviet Union. So they essentially declared the continuity of a piece of the Soviet Union in this little piece of territory. And it is, in fact, kind of a theme park of the Soviet Union. If you've ever been there, it's just changing a little bit now. But about five years ago, you used to be able to go there and basically see what the Soviet Union looked like under Brezhnev. It was sort of frozen in time, uh, down to the little, you know, babushki ladies who were sort of cleaning up the flower beds in front of the statue of Lenin in front of the big supreme Soviet building. Um, and so it's a little breakaway territory. And there's some theory now, there's some speculation that uh, Putin's long game may be to, to, in a sense, outflank Ukraine by taking Crimea and Ukraine south, where the Black Sea fleet is, and then taking Transnistria. I mean, taking, when I say, let the Transnistrians hold a referendum, and 99% of them will vote to join Russia, which they already did in 2006. They already had a referendum, but they have another one. 
and then pass another act of parliament that recognizes them. Here's the trick about the precedent that Putin has set with Crimea. Even if the Transnistrians, I mean, even if the, the Russians don't want to take Transnistria, any enterprising Transnistrian politician who wants a much bigger stage for himself than this tiny unrecognized territory with 300,000 inhabitants, most of whom are absentees, most of whom have Russian passports already anyway, because the Russians freely hand them out to anybody who wants them, because they like having citizens in their neighborhood. They can simply put Putin over a barrel now and say, hey, you recognize Crimea. All they have to do is hold their own referendum. And then all the international media in the world is going to descend on Crimea, I mean on Transnistria, and everyone's going to conclude Transnistria is next, and then Putin's credibility will be on the line. Remember what I said, how important his credibility is and his image? Then he's going to have to annex Transnistria. So, you know, you heard it here first. Thanks to the question from the gentleman. Transnistria maybe is next. The, uh, would, would you say that Poland and the Baltic states have a misplaced fear of Putin, uh, given that American flight squadrons are going in the Baltic, Poland's already a NATO country, is it misplaced? And then lastly, I can't let the uh, Transnistria go on. Uh, unnoticed by me. We had a plant in Transnistria that we had to close in about 2004. Who's we? I'll tell you later. Okay. Uh, we, lost our, we lost our assets, okay. <laughs> $10 million write-off, <laughs> and we sent the file to the U.S. State Department. Do you think we'll ever get our money back? <laughs> I'll answer the easy one first. Um, I would say that would be to, to be negotiated. Um, but seriously, you know, assets in Transnistria are probably the most important question because Transnistria, as I'm sure you know, or certainly your business associates know, was uh, the most heavily industrialized part of Moldova. That's because the Soviets practiced, based on the World War II experience, the lesson of keeping all their stuff as far east as possible in case the Germans came back. Seriously, they built 40% of the industry of Moldova was built in this teeny little strip of territory as close as possible to Russia. Um, and so one of the big debates now is, you know, well, what about all this, the, the national property that's been privatized in the last 23 years under this, you know, nominally independent government? It's been sold and sold again to all kinds of businessmen and shady folks in the region. You know, so if Moldova ever reunifies or if Transnistria joins Russia, but if its status changes in some way, you know, of what validity are the ownership papers that have a stamp from, you know, the Transnistrian independent government on them? They're going to have the same exact problem in Crimea, which, by the way, there are a great many European companies that operate businesses in Crimea now. Hotels, there's a big uh, Crimean vodka company, it's a big British-owned company. You know, their papers all say Ukraine on them, right? So you own this piece of land, you own this factory, according to Ukrainian authorities. Well, I wonder if Moscow accepts that. I'm sure that there are some business associates of Mr. Putin who are very interested in those assets. So the answer is, yeah. I mean, this is what, when, when, when businessmen conclude that, you know, politics is sort of, this crazy thing that's done off in capital cities, it usually comes home to roost very quickly, and I think it has here. Um, on the Baltic states, is the fear rational? It's definitely not rational. I mean, the fear is deeply irrational, but that's kind of the problem. Um, I think the biggest problem that we have had with Poland and the Baltic states, the Baltic states, to be fair, the Baltic states much more than Poland. Poland is actually now kind of growing up into one of the bigger and more responsible countries of Europe. They often actually bring the Germans kind of kicking and screaming along to important, responsible decisions. The one can of worms that I really believe Putin does not want to open because it will call his bluff, it will force us in the West to actually hitch up our britches and do something, is to invade a NATO country, right? I'm not saying there'll be nuclear war, but if he does that, He's tried cyber war against the Estonians, right? He's, he's poked them in the eye many times. But if he actually mounts a military attack or a military incursion against a NATO country, he runs the risk of actually having to pay the piper, and then he'll look weak because he'll lose. Is there any? Is it on? Oh. Yes. Who in Russia is on the horizon to go against Putin? Is there anybody, or is he just totally forever there? Well, it's not forever. It's not, but yeah, yeah. I mean, all, all lifetimes are finite, but um, he's, you know, all, all indications are the guy's in pretty good shape. Um, <laughs> whatever, whatever you think of his antics and his Botox, um, he, you know, he, he's, he's pretty healthy. And, uh, and I think there is a good possibility that all other things being equal, and remember the Russian economy is probably the most important indicator here, if he can hold it together, um, 
he's already proven once before that he can pick a man to replace him. He can back that guy up, so be kind of an eminence grease, run the show, but have a front man actually, you know, holding the, the formal reins of power. And if he wants to, he can come back. He can do all those things nominally without violating the Russian Constitution. So there's very little reason to think that there would have to be a revolution in order for Putin to be replaced. There's this sort of misguided notion that power only ever changes hands through revolutions in Russia. You know, power changed hands peacefully between Yel Yeltsin and Putin. There's, you know, there's no reason why Putin couldn't simply designate a successor and the system, the current constellation of Russian power would survive. But then there's another theory, right? And this is kind of like John McCain has sort of popularized this, right? Like, you know, Arab Spring, Slavic Spring, Kremlin is next. And it is possible. It's possible. But I'll tell you what makes it less likely. What makes it less likely is when we in the West identify golden children, like Timoshenko in Ukraine or Saakashvili in, in Georgia. You know, if we pick a Russian opposition figure, and not the little, the house opposition, you know, sort of the trained people he has sitting in the Duma who are the pretend opposition, or the crazy communist fringe opposition. Like actual opposition. There are some of these guys. They're not in power right now. And one of the things we love to do in the West is give them money. You know, prop them up. Make them more serious. Give them training. Invite them to give lectures, right? Anytime we do that, we discredit them. Automatically, they lose the middle of the Russian electorate. Hey, plenty, plenty of Russian liberals will still come out in the streets and protest and support these guys. But the people who won't support them are the people who actually support the government of the state, pay the taxes, run the society, because of the values that I told you about before, right? They want to live decently, they want to be Russian, and they want to be free in their way. What they don't want is to be a lapdog of the West. They don't want to be run by corrupt, self-interested international playboys who go around enjoying international conferences instead of solving problems locally in Russia. And they don't want to be disrespected. And these people consistently disrespect them. They show that they actually don't care what the views of a majority of Russian society is. They're quite conservative, by the way. So when one of these, I mean, I don't mean to pick on an issue, but when one of these liberal opposition guys comes out strongly against Putin's anti-gay laws and talks about tolerance of gays and, you know, gays are great, I mean, look, the Russian society is just not there. Like 75% of Russian society is strongly against gay relationships and gay marriage. So it's just not good politics, right? The problem is when we in the West pick these people and anoint them, we ultimately discredit them and we saddle them with ideologies and values that don't sell well in Russia. So if you want Putin to be gone, stay out of Russian politics. Thank you. Uh, from a teacher's viewpoint, uh, if you could comment and educate us with respect to the changes from the Soviet Union to Russia, the different countries, how that happened, the politics of each country or something of that sort compared to now, in, in, in just a few words. Uh, um, um, then bad, now better. <laughs> I, the bot bottom line is two factors drove the collapse of the Soviet Union. Those two factors are still important now. One is resistance against Russian domination on the part of the non-Russian uh, Soviet ethnic groups. Uh, and the other was opposition to an economic system, not a political system, but an economic system which fundamentally rejected individualism, the difference between and among people. The people have different choices, different preferences, different desires to work, different desires to advance. And the Soviet system was just deeply irrational. And so it ended. I hope that makes sense. It's two things that are true about Russia today. It's very nationalist. It's very ethnically nationalist, which the Soviet Union was not. And individualism is very important in Russia. Individual wealth, achievement, power. I've never seen a bigger wealth gap than between successful Russians and unsuccessful Russians. They have more billionaires in Russia, as I'm sure you know, than in any other country. Yeah, I'll cut you all the way in the back. Uh, 
Russia and China have always had a very unique relationship in the 20th century. What is that relationship today? You know, a, uh, a Chinese, boy, you guys are asking like the giant questions, right? You, you, like entire classes are taught on each of these questions. Um, they won't let me teach a Transnistria class yet, unfortunately. Maybe now. Um, a Chinese uh, scholar told me about two months ago, uh, you know, we have, and this is a reflection of just how differently Chinese think about the world, I think. He said, uh, we have a lot of experience with the Russians. Uh, we had a few hundred years of the Romanovs. They were pretty effective. Uh, then we had the Soviets. They were kind of okay. Uh, then we had Yeltsin and the new Russia. They were terrible. Now Putin's back, and it's kind of like the Romanovs again. So I think the Chinese perspective on Russia uh, obviously has had many changes, some linked to ideology, but fundamentally the kind of the geopolitics, the kind of fundamentals of these two countries and their relative positions to one another is when both are strong and powerful and prosperous, they know how to coexist with each other. They are not on an inevitable collision course. And anybody who theorizes to you somehow that Russia and China will destroy each other is wrong. In a world where we have marginal uh, global growth, do you believe that Putin's macroeconomic model will support the values that you've espoused of the Russian people? No, but, so, so the answer is no because, well, first of all, the proof is in the pudding, you know, 0% growth this year, 1% next year, maybe, um, and capital flight could always go up and wipe that out. Um, and he needs to spend money, obviously, to bring you know ordinary people in the middle and at the bottom of the system along, and to get them to support him because you know that's the one thing that's appreciably different to them about him than previous leaders is that they he pays salaries, he pays the military their salaries, which Yeltsin didn't do. Um, but I think ultimately the system uh, is flawed. I think that growth probably will continue to decline or be very marginal. At the same time, what's very different about the Russian experience, and I think Putin is gambling on this to a very large degree, is Russians have a very high pain threshold. It, it's not infinite, it won't last forever, but Russia's willingness, you know, they endured like 25% unemployment. So depression, US depression era levels of unemployment, uh, you know, Spain financial crisis levels of unemployment for more than a decade, right? Russians endured those things, and there was not a revolution. So I think his idea, remember, these are, these are people uh, whose capital cities were under siege during World War II, who lost 25 million people, civilian and military, during the Second World War. You know, their attitude, they have cumulatively lost more people to terrorist attacks than we lost in 9-11. Their attitude, their pain threshold towards the costs of having a strong and effective state is very different than what we understand here in the West. It sort of makes the stuff that we protest and write cranky newspaper editorials and stuff about seem pretty petty. But it won't last forever. Uh, could you just uh, tie up capitalism versus communism and is there communism? Or is, is Cuba still under their sway? Or what, what's, what's happening in that? Oh, look, all I can say about that is, again, I, I, don't think, I don't think anything that's going on with Russia today, the Communist Party consistently performs between 10 and 20 percent in Russian elections. It is a marginal factor. It has never risen above 20 percent. It never will. As the, as the generation that experienced Soviet communism dies out, the party will die out as well. Communism is thoroughly discredited. People like free enterprise in Russia. Putin's not a communist. He's many things. He is not a communist. I call him kind of the, the ultimate CEO, right? He is a rational profit maximizer. He doesn't care about gross sales. He doesn't care about empire for the sake of empire. He doesn't care about democracy. That's not to say that he is detached, right? He's like a CEO. If information comes up from the factory floor that's important and that's relevant, you better believe he cares about it. But he doesn't care what the ordinary worker thinks just for the sake of democracy. So he's a very rational, calculating guy, but it's not about communism for him. So the notion that there's some kind of, you know, resurgent Soviet Union in like a red flag sense, 
you know, when you see people, uh, these newspaper pictures became very popular in the last week of uh, people painting uh, red sheets, you know, with a stencil spraying white paint, you know, making new hammer and sickle flags in, in Crimea. Okay, two things about it. One, look at the people in those pictures. Most of them are retirees. And, you know, probably don't have to tell this audience, retirees usually like the good old days. <laughs> and for them, the Soviet Union was the good old days. Um, but, but second, uh, it's, a, it's a shorthand. It's a kind of proxy for them. It's not about the ideology of communism. It's about Russia. So waving the Soviet flag is a way of saying, in Soviet times, we used to be a part of Russia. Many more people are waving Russian flags, actually, than, than red flags. But I think the red ones are easier to make, because you need more paint to make the, the three stripes. So does anyone in, uh, in Washington that's in power <laughs> listen to guys like you and other Russian es experts? I mean, uh, people who have been there and people who know, uh, so, as you do. Lest you think, thank you for the question. Um, I'll, <laughs> no. uh, so uh, lest you think that you know, experts always have all the answers, Mike McFall, the guy that I pointed out, who, who was just ambassador to Moscow uh, for the last three years, two years, uh, he's a Russia expert. I mean, hands down, he is, he is a Russia hand. He speaks good Russian. He spent a lot of time in the country. Uh, he was one of my professors. Um, so we don't always have all the answers, right? We can, you know, it's a, a classic uh, explanation, right, is um, uh, sort of like the intelligence community, right? We can give you like 50-50 on what's going to happen next, but we can give you 100% about why what happened was inevitable, um, <laughs> just after the fact. Uh, no, it, actually, it depends. So on Capitol Hill, there's a problem of just short attention spans, which is like you're not going to get a member of Congress to listen to anything for more than about 20 seconds. Unless